two or three people are gathered together in the name of the Lord, He hears us. He is with us. <coughs> I think you heard what I said. It's really good to come together in the presence of the Lord, isn't it? That's really wonderful. It's the freedom that we have in this country. And we are not just here alone today, uh, a relatively small group of people. We are with thousands and millions of people across the whole of the universe, worshipping and praising Him today. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that as you have promised, you are here, present with us today. And thanking you for all that you have taught us and done for us in these last days. Thank you particularly of the coming of your only loved Son into the world to give his life a ransom for many, to die for us on the cross, that through his resurrection we have made, we have new life. In thinking of these things in the past few days, we rejoice that you are with us. We pray especially this morning for the churches in Andhra Pradesh, for the 150 churches of the Jesus Mercy Children Group, that as they meet together at different times during this day, that you would be with each one of them, that you would guide and lead and bless the pastors speaking to them, and that they may be challenged and encouraged by your word to them. Speak to us, we pray, to open our ears and eyes, hearts and minds, to hear what you are saying to us, and give us the strength, as well as the willingness, to follow as you were disciples. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and for his sake. Amen. Amen. And we begin with a really wonderful hymn, As with Gladness Men of Old. Is anybody here who doesn't know that? Look at the screen, the words will appear behind me. Let's sing. If you're able to stand and sing, please do. Thank you for the musicians playing for us again this morning. As with Gladness Men of Old. <laughs>
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Right, so, just announce this today. First of all, after service, there will be a time of prayer, even though like, we haven't got the chair at the moment. Also, there, there's also refreshments in the back room, which I have at the moment, nice. Then, in the, then, this evening, at New Life International have invited us to join with them at 8 p.m. for a social evening, followed by prayer for me down 30 p.m. onwards, going on to just after midnight, I presume, for anyone who's that way inclined. <laughs> then, uh, on, well, then I don't think there are no midweek meetings. Teams this week. Next weekend we have New Life International meeting as normal. Also, this here there will be the open house on some Saturday morning as normal for anyone who wishes to drop in. Then on su next Sunday is the communion covenant and communion service, covenant renewal and communion service. <coughs> so be prepared for that in your hearts. The following Sunday is the church members meeting. That's on the 14th of January. It's the church members meeting with and bring your own lunch to that one. Then on 21st of January we have Tim Doggett coming to speak to us and that will be when the shared lunch is this month. So please note the fact they swapped round the shared, when the shared lunches. I hope you can all remember that. So, <laughs> yes. Thank you, Tony, for your very clear and very <laughs> thorough presentation uh, and for its entertainment value. It is something which uh, we really appreciate. Uh, it's very, very clear. If you do have any questions, uh, please ask Tony afterwards or, or one of the leadership team. Yeah, or ring us up, um, you're very welcome to text us to find out what's going on. We do have some challenges at the moment with our digital communication, all three of us in the leadership team, um, but the telephones are still working, so please feel free to contact us in that way. I'm very pleased to ask Carol to come forward and to lead us in prayer. Thank you, Carol. Morning, everybody. This is the last Sunday of this year. Surprising how quickly the years go. A sign of age, I think. But we stand at the end of one year and at the beginning of another. And I was reminded this week as I was praying, um, God spoke about the time when Moses had died and the children of Israel were finished out of the um, wilderness, but were waiting to go into the promised land. And God spoke very clearly to Joshua. And I just felt that those words that God spoke to Joshua, God is speaking to us today. And he said, get ready. And he said to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And God is saying that to us, as I have been, so I will be. Be strong and courageous, and I will never leave you or forsake you. The Lord your God will go with you wherever you go. I don't know what sort of a year you've had. Mine's been a bit like a roller coaster. Some of you have sailed through this year with no problems, maybe. Some of you are anxious about the coming year and what's happening in the broader world. But God says, be strong and courageous because I am with you and I will never leave you or forsake you. We have an amazing God. We have our Jehovah Jireh, our all-sufficient God. So let's pray. 
Father, we come before you humbly, so grateful for all that you are, so grateful to you for all that you have been, and so trusting for what you will be to us in the future. We praise you that you are the all-sufficient God. You are Jehovah Jireh, our great provider. It doesn't matter what we need. You, you are the all-sufficient God who will provide our every need. We praise you and thank you for all that you've done in us and through us, keeping us walking with you. We praise you for our salvation. We praise you for that wonderful gift of Jesus that we've just been celebrating. We thank you for your great love for us that doesn't treat us as our sin deserves. We praise you that for the times when we said, my foot is slipping, your love, O oh Lord, supported us. We praise you for the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives and in the lives of those who have come to know you and those who have come to salvation this year. For the many Bibles that have been placed into people's hands, for the many people who have gone into the world preaching and teaching, seeing lives changed for your glory. Thank you that you are at work in our world despite all the negativity and the darkness. You are at work in the world. You have not left us as orphans. Yet, Lord, we know that in the words of Isaiah, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples. But we also know, Lord, that you rule and reign. Lord, may we as individuals as a community of your people and as your church nationally and globally, be obedient to your command at the beginning of this new year and arise, shine, for your light has come. Lord, rekindle the flame in us that has burnt low. May we show your light and life in every place to which we go. Bring us closer to you this year and help us to allow you to have free reign in our lives. We pray for all those who have found this past year challenging, whether through sickness, anxiety, poverty, fear or despair. There are people in our own fellowship who are struggling at the moment, whether that is through sickness or family. Shall we just take some time just to pray for those people whose perhaps names God is bringing to your minds. We pray for our nation, that you would lighten the darkness that is over our cities, towns and communities. We pray for our young people caught up in gangs and drug culture, and for Christian teachers and youth workers who are shining your light into their darkness. We pray for peace in Ukraine and a cessation of hostilities. We pray for Israel and Gaza and pray that peace will prevail, that the hostages will be released and that in all areas of conflict your will will be done and that your kingdom would come into hearts and minds. 
We pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters throughout this world. We pray especially for the relatives and the community of the 160 Nigerian Christians killed on Christmas Eve. Lord, would you strengthen, comfort, and give wisdom, courage, and boldness to stand for you in the face of oppression and persecution. Lord, we don't know what lies ahead for us this next year, but we do know that you are a faithful, <coughs> trustworthy God and will never leave us or forsake us, no matter <coughs> what our circumstances and no matter what trials we face. We praise you for the privilege of knowing you and for all that you have been, are, and will be to each one of us. And to you, Lord God, be all the praise and glory. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Thank you, Carol. We're going to sing together the hymn, We Three Kings of Orient Heart. Please feel free to stand to sing. Israel mourned and sought after the Lord. 
And Samuel said to the whole house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then rid yourselves of your foreign gods and the asterisk, and commit yourselves to the Lord, and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their Baals and Asterus and served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Assemble all Israel at Mizpah, and I will intercede with the Lord for you. When they had assembled at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day they fasted, and there they confessed. We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel was leader of Israel at Mizpah. When the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. And when the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. They said to Samuel, Do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. Then Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it up as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf, and the Lord answered him. While Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to engage Israel in battle. But that day the Lord thundered with a loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed before the Israelites. The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to a point below beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shem. He named it Ebenezer saying, Thus far has the Lord helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not invade Israelite territory again. Amen. Thank you, Brenda. Can you go to this part of the... No, we'll go, we'll go with this. That's fine. Let's sing together the carol, See Amid the Winter Snow, and feel free, free to stand to sing. Thank you.
hearts and minds to hear his voice and to be willing to follow him. I think he will say different things to each one of us. And sometimes the same thing to each one of us, but it's his voice that we want to hear. On Christmas Eve, on the fourth Sunday in Advent last week, we talked about the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 14, being a kind of super spoiler. That is to say, a passage which basically gave away all the main secrets of the New Testament story at one go. Its beginning, its pivot points, its emphasis, its orientation, <coughs> its direction, and of course its conclusion. And that seems to have come across as a very useful and helpful approach, so today we'll do something similar, at least at the beginning. This time we will begin with a mega spoiler. We're going to look at one part of the Old Testament. We're going to ask God to reveal and apply the truths hidden there to our hearts and lives as individuals as a church. So hold on to your seats. We're looking together at some narrative stories written in the book of 1 Samuel, from which we've just had the reading from chapter 7. The books of Samuel, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, were originally written as one continuous story, but they were rather long, so they got divided quite logically into 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. And after the nation of Israel was rescued from slavery in Egypt, as we also heard in our prayers, and made a covenant with God at Mount Sinai, they eventually came into the Promised Land. And having finally arrived in the Promised Land, what was Israel supposed to do? To be faithful to God and to obey the covenant commands. But if we look at the book of Judges, which comes before 1 Samuel, we see how Israel repeatedly failed, almost without exception. It was a real time of moral chaos that showed Israel's need for wise and faithful leaders. And the books of Samuel provide an answer to that need, which is why, although it's a strange subject to take for the last service of the year, on the 31st of December, this is how the Lord's led. This is where the answer to the needs of the people is found. That's where we come in. Samuel is a key leader and a key prophet through the first section of the book in what we call 1 Samuel 1 to 7. So, who are the main characters in our story today? The first one is Hannah, and then Eli and his family, then Samuel, as you might expect, and then the people of God, in that case the Israelites, the Philistines, and most importantly, and not last, but last in the list, God himself. We start in a situation of chaos. We are introduced to the wonderfully moving story of a woman called Hannah, who is grieved because she has never been able to have children. By God's grace, she finally has a son, Samuel, and in her genuine and deeply heartfelt joy, she sings a truly amazing poetic song, really amazing, in chapter 2. And Hannah sings about how God opposes the proud and exalts the humble, and about how, despite human evil, God is working out his purposes and about how God one day will raise up an anointed king for his people. And this poem or song of, of, of Hannah has been placed right at the beginning of 1 Samuel to introduce things that we see throughout the story that we're looking at briefly today. And Hannah's son Samuel grows up to become a great prophet and leader for the people of Israel at the same time as the Philistines rise to power as their enemy. Now, it's rather difficult to see this. We checked it right from the back yesterday. But the Philistines were a people group that lived basically in this area down here, so-called Philistine city-states. There were five of them, three of them are listed, Ashdod, Ashkelon, 
and Gaza. I think you'd have looked at much similar to this many times on TV in recent weeks. The heartland of ancient Philistia, Philistia, the Philistine area, was on the Mediterranean Sea coast, the southeastern shore of it. The, they had really advanced technology and they were a formidable military force. They were idol worshippers and they were soothsayers. That is to say, they, they were people who pretended to know the future, who predicted or prophesied or forecasted the future. Isaiah 2.6 tells about the Philistines that they that they practice divination, like horoscopes, palmistry, premonition, seeking knowledge of the future or of the unknown by so-called supernatural means. <coughs> These are the kind of things that the Philistines practice, and that is how they were led, not by the living God. And the Philistines have become the main enemy for the people of Israel. And in a really crucial battle, the Israelites got really arrogant, very proud, and instead of praying, they got out the Ark of the Covenant as a kind of magical symbol. <clears throat> well, they thought, if we put this symbol out in the open, we will gain victory in battle against our enemy. But God, because of the people of God, Israelites' pride and presumption, God allowed Israel to lose the battle, a really massive defeat, and the Ark was stolen. And they took it, the Philistines, and they placed it in the temple of their god, Dagon. And what happened then was really awesome. I find this story to be, it would be unbelievable if it wasn't true. But after the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. You've heard that word once already, haven't you? They took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then they carried the Ark into Dagon's temple and they set it beside Dagon. When the people of Ashdod got up early the next day, there was Dagon falling on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and they put him back in his place. But the following morning when they got up, there was Dagon falling on his face on the ground in front of the Ark of the Lord. His head and his hands had been broken off and they were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. That is why to this day, neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who enter Dagon's temple in Ashdod step on the threshold. These are the gods whom many, many people worship and who we would have worshipped before we came to know Jesus as our Lord. These gods have no power in comparison with the power of the Almighty God who made the heavens and sustains them and who raised his son, Jesus Christ, from the dead and who lives now in the heavens. All these other gods can do nothing. If they have heads, they can't think. If they have ears, they can't hear. If they've got eyes, they cannot see. If they have legs, they can't walk. If they have hands, they can't feel. They can do nothing. They have no power over us if we live in the Lord and according to his word. So the God of Israel responded very clearly by defeating the Philistines and all their idols without an army. He didn't even have the people of God, the Israelites, to help him. And quite honestly, he didn't need them because of their pride and their arrogance. And the Philistines, scared stiff, suffering under all kinds of plagues, send the ark back to Israel. And at this time, this Ark of the Covenant is the physical manifestation of the presence of God and his supreme power. It was the place of the Lord's presence amongst his people. But you see, God is not the plaything of Israel. God opposes pride both amongst the Philistines and the Israelites. And if Israel is to experience his covenant blessing, like we, that we need and they need to remain humble and obedient. So that's the background to our passage today. Let's look at the attitude and behaviour of God's people after all these things. What was God saying through the prophet? What was important to God's people now? Nigel, can you find me the slide with verses 2 to 4? It's the first one in the reading that Brenda took for us. Please. So there we are. So you can look at that and I will read. It was a long time, 20 years and all, in all, 
that the Ark remained in Kiriath Jerim. This is a place on the M1, or the equivalent of the M1 in Israel, between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. You'll know where that is. And, uh, and it remained 20 years there. And all the people of Israel mourned and sought after the Lord. And Israel said to the whole house of Israel, if you are returning to the Lord with all your hearts, if then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. So the people of God at that time, the Israelites, put away their Baals and Ashtoreths and served the Lord only. What was God saying? What was important to God's people now? It was important to return to the Lord with all their hearts. It was important to rid themselves of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths. The Ashtoreth was an ancient Phoenician goddess of love and fertility and the Baals had this kind of function as well. And the, the people too wanted to commit themselves to the Lord and to serve the Lord only. How easy it is for people all over the world to add a kind of Jesus worship to their great connection of, well, we are also Hindus, we are also Buddhists, we are also this, we are also that. We love Jesus too. It's not like that. It's complete commitment to the only living God. Serve the Lord only. That's what they wanted to do. What does this mean for us? What consequences does it have for my attitude and my behaviour? Do we want God to deliver us from sin and from the attacks of our enemies? Do we want him to protect us from false teaching, from idol worship and from pride? That's exactly what the Israelites did, all of them, all at the same time, in every aspect of what they were being asked to do. This nation that I described last week as the strongest individualistic nation on earth, they did everything together because they chose to follow the living God. Because God had spoken to them through the prophet he had sent to let them, lead them. Because God saw their hearts and had mercy on them. See, when their prophetic leader Samuel saw that, he saw how the people were, were thinking, how they were feeling, how they were wanting to behave. That they wanted to commit themselves completely to the only one God. He called an assembly, like a normal church meeting. He called them all together. We read that in 1 Samuel 7 verse 5. Can you go to the next slide for me please? Then Samuel said, Assemble all Israel at Mizpah, and I will intercede with the Lord for you. I will pray to the Lord for you. It's a good way to hold a church meeting, I think. <coughs> to come together. To pray. To confess our sins before the Lord and to seek God, to do really important business with God. In this account we read that they all sought the Lord, they prayed and they followed his word. The minutes of this assembly are remarkable, aren't they? When they came together as Samuel had told them to do, he prayed to the Lord for them. They fasted, they confessed their sins against the Lord. You see, because we're not fighting against flesh and, flesh and blood, as soon as the Israelites had made their peace with God, just as soon as the Israelites had taken this further step of obedience and followed God's words through to them, through the servant, the prophet Samuel, the Philistines hear about it. And what is their response? They say, well, we'll not beat them now, we didn't beat them before. No. There's real evil behind them. Their response was to attack Israel. When the Israelites heard about this, they were very afraid because of the Philistines. How quickly we respond as believers, maybe as a church, with worry, with anxiety and with fear. When we look at what we can see and forget the invisible. How quick we are as the people of God to criticise leaders and to criticise the Lord. 
If we make a stand for God, if we take one step forward for God, and then another step, and then another step, the opposition will come in and threaten us, challenge us, and attempt to make us reverse our decision for God and go backwards as believers and as churches. We read that in 1 Samuel 7, verse 7, which I think is on the next slide. When the Philistines heard Israel have assembled at Mizpah, the rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. When the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid. If we make a stand, the opposition will attempt not only to knock us down, but to knock us out for our struggle. It's probably the verse that I overuse and overquote. But our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the rulers, the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. If you don't believe that, please look at that verse again and ask God to tell you that that is true. We are hard pressed on every side, says Paul, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but we're not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Therefore, we do not lose heart. We don't give up. Although outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly each one of us is being renewed day by day. For, as Paul says, and he knew what affliction was, for our light and momentary troubles. You got that? Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we should fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So what do the Israelites do with their fear? They didn't hide it. They didn't deny it. They didn't ignore it. They went to their leader and appealed strongly to their leader to continue crying out to God on their behalf. How did the leader respond? He listened and that's what he did what the Lord wanted him to do. He took a suckling lamb and he sacrificed it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf. And what did the Lord do? He answered him. And he always will. Those who cry from a pure heart to him, he will answer. But you say, Alec, we're never afraid. Really? What do we do with our fear? What do we do with our worry? What we do with our anxieties? What is it that we are frightened of? I'm not going to do it, of course, but if I ask you to write down three things that really scare you at this moment, thinking about the year to come, you wouldn't take very long to do it, I don't think. But we all have Bibles at home. And there are hundreds of verses in God's Word about fear, and I've just chosen a few. These verses put our fears into perspective. We could memorize them, we could reflect on them, we could write them down, we could discuss them, we could sing them. May these verses give us all perspective and reminders of God's presence with us in and through our fears. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Emmanuel, God with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I am the good shepherd. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? God is our refuge and strength. He's always there. An ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we don't fear. Not anymore. 
Even if the earth gives way, even if the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, and their mountains quake with the surging, the Lord is with me. He is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. <coughs> do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. I'm the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, don't fear, I will help you. We can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I won't be afraid. The Lord, our God, fights for us. Jesus says, don't be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. You came near when I called you, says God. And it said, do not fear. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust and I'm not afraid. This is what I agreed with you. This is what I covenanted you with you when you came out of Egypt and my spirit remains among you. Don't fear. All the hairs of your head are numbered individually. Don't be afraid. You're worth more. And many sparrows. Aren't these encouraging words and challenging? I don't think I'm the only person in this room who has some fears or had some fears about the new year. But if I look at these words and I look at the Lord, I don't have any fear anymore. And neither do you. Whatever we feel our needs to be, whatever fears we experience when we see the fulfillment of our needs being threatened, we need to remember that the only real thing we need fear, fear is being separated from the love of God. But you know what it says in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. I'm sure you haven't forgotten it, but I'm going to read it again. Romans 8, 38 to 39. I'm convinced neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In his time, Samuel assembled the people who all together, out of their need, at their request. God has spoken to them all. Like I prayed last week that God would speak to all the Muslims in this town in dreams and visions and with healings and miracles. God can do that. And he's doing that. Assembled here in this place, we share the word of God together. And we pray together. I want to get to this one. Where's the ark? So, we come together here in the presence of God to pray like this. Families, Younger people, we pray. Dark skinned people, light skinned people, people of all kinds of backgrounds, younger people, older people, we all come together here to pray. Because the Ark of the Covenant, which was a symbol of the presence of God, this presence of God is with us here when we pray. This is the modern ark. Do we realize 
both our needs and the power of God to meet those needs. Do we recognize our fears and the challenges to living according to God's word in a society which has chosen to ignore, <clears throat> to dismantle, and to make fun of the ways of the living God? Samuel basically inaugurated or started the Reformation that characterized his time by calling together a great assembly of all Israel at Mizpah which was at that time this is the sort of the centre of political and religious activity for the nation. And at Mizpah, what did they do? <clears throat> In deep humiliation, because of their sins, because they've broken their relationship with God and with one another, they renewed their vows and entered again into a covenant with the God of their fathers. It was the period in the history of God's people, in the history of Israel, of massive widespread religious awakening and of revived national life because they came to the Lord, said sorry, he forgave them and gave them the strength to do what he wanted them to do. The Hebrews charged against the enemy of the Philistine with great fury, it says, and the Philistines were completely routed. And then Samuel commemorated the victory by erecting a memorial stone. And here we get this word again, which he called Ebenezer. Ebenezer. Up until now, thus far, the Lord has helped us. The Lord has helped us to this point. That's where we end this year, acknowledging, rejoicing that God has led us up till now. He has led us this far, but we're going to go on as he leads us in his strength. God willing, we move into the next year. Let us, like the Israelites under Samuel, meet together with God. Let us all seek forgiveness for any wrongs that we may have done or things that we should have done and haven't. Let us renew our vows and our covenant with him. Next week, God willing, we will begin with our covenant renewal service and communion service. In that service on January the 7th, we will welcome our sister Carol into membership and we will hold a time of open prayer. Because that's where the Lord is. In our being together. In our seeking his forgiveness together. In praising him together. And in asking him well, for the things that we need. And that we need to do. That he will give us strength. And openness for his ways. I look especially next week at 1 Samuel. Chapter 7 verse 12a which is the last part of the reading today. If you've got these three pictures in your mind and in your heart, I would pray to God that, that starting with me we can all see this and visualise this. This is where the power is. We're not saying to God, we're putting out the Ark of the Covenant and that will do it. No, we're saying to God, we are coming to you humbly and saying sorry and please sort that out which you've done and lead us on I can't do any more I've chosen this hymn as our final hymn today it's not a Christmas carol for which you probably don't need an apology but after I'd chosen it, it became very clear to me that God is saying, look, God becomes visible in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the cradle, in the hay, in the squalor. He comes to earth, Jesus comes to earth, the only Son of God, and 33 years long, he is on the earth, he made and sustained. 
but I think we should look at the invisible. Not at the enemy who is visible, but at the power and the strength and the incredible wisdom and understanding of our living God. So when we sing this song, let's praise and worship from our hearts, thanking him for how he has led us during these past 12 months and looking to him to lead us on in this coming year. Good morning. Thank you. Amen.
we close with the words of the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, ever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. As Tony suggested, you have the opportunity to join in prayer for five minutes at the back or to move straight forward or afterwards.